in our headlines on this Friday afternoon, July 22nd. The UN administration is pushing for an extensive revision to the current taxation scheme to allow for a substantial ease in tax burdens on business ventures, homeowners and the less privileged. The Culture Ministry is looking to expand its support of the K content industry by nurturing talent, supporting production and establishing a global content company. And the European Central Bank has raised its benchmark interest rate by a higher than expected half a percentage point in reflection of its determination to rein in soaring inflation. Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho says the Yoon administration is hammering out a framework aimed at easing tax burdens on businesses and on people. A related bill will be handed in to the National Assembly by September this year. Om Jeong has our top story. Revitalizing the economy by promoting growth led by the private sector. That's the crux of South Korea's latest revision to the tax code published on Thursday with the goal of improving corporate competitiveness. The tax revision has put an emphasis on drastically increasing support for companies to expand their investment and employment. First, the taxation system will be reformed to meet global standards. Lowering the top rate of corporate tax from the current 25 to 22 percent is one of the main changes. Also, the government will help smaller businesses by putting more companies into the lowest corporate tax bracket. Also in the spotlight are changes in the real estate taxes. The government is looking to ease the property tax burden for people amid runaway home prices. In South Korea, people or companies with large real estate assets get an extra tax bill for holding properties on top of the standard property tax. For owners of two or more residential properties, the threshold before having to pay this extra tax will be raised from the current 600 million won to 900 million won, which is roughly 700,000 U.S. dollars. Also, for those who own just one home, it'll be raised next year from the current 1.1 billion won to 1.2 billion won, which is just over $900,000. And just for this year, it'll be temporarily raised to 1.4 billion won. The way of calculating property ownership tax will also change. Currently, greater tax rates are applied for owning more houses, but under the change, tax rates will depend on the house price. An expert says this can make property taxes better balanced. Currently, a person who has three houses worth a total of two billion won will pay more taxes than another person who just owns one home worth three billion won. If we look at it in terms of money, it is not equitable. Another major goal of the tax code revision is to provide more financial stability for the public amid soaring inflation. The government will reduce the tax burden on those in low-income brackets. We will reduce the tax burden on people by expanding the range of the two lowest income tax brackets. But those earning more than 120 million won will see the amount they can deduct from their income tax reduced. Chu added that for workers, more meal expenses will be exempt from tax. The limit for tax-free meals at work will be doubled to 200,000 won or roughly $150 a month. The government is also looking to help industries recover from the pandemic. To help the movie industry recover, the government is also making movie tickets tax-deductible from July next year. Those earning less than 53,000 U.S. dollars a year can get 30 percent of their spending at movie theaters deducted from their income tax bill. With all these changes, the government says the tax code revision will result in a roughly $10 billion drop in tax revenue. But the finance minister says the reduction accounts for 3 percent of total tax revenue, which is within the usual 5 percent annual rise in tax revenue. The government is going to send the bill to the National Assembly by September. Om ji Arirang News. The Trade Ministry will strengthen the country's semiconductor industry by boosting business investments, expanding educational opportunities and reinforcing research ventures. Our Ideon reports. More investment in the semiconductor industry.
That's the plan announced by the Minister of Trade, Industry and Energy on Thursday while visiting a chip material factory in the city of Hwasong, south of Seoul. The blueprint to boost the chip industry includes three major points. First, to encourage chip-related companies to invest over 300 trillion won, or about 260 billion U.S. dollars, in the next five years. The administration also aims to boost government spending on essential infrastructure for chip complexes, like electricity and industrial water. There will be more tax benefits, too, for investment in semiconductor equipment and R&D. Tax deductions for large companies that invest in equipment related to nationally strategic technologies like semiconductors will be raised by two percentage points to around 8 to 12 percent. But one expert says those rates need to go higher. The U.S. and European countries are trying to pass legislation to increase tax deductions for chip-related companies to 30 to 50 percent. If those bills pass, Korea should raise its deductions by even more. The second point is training new talent. The government aims to train more than 150,000 people for the semiconductor industry by 2031 and designate graduate schools specializing in CHIP, which will entitle them to more support for instructors and class materials. The first thing they need to do, experts say, is to bring on more faculty. CHIP-related institutions these days lack faculty. One idea could be to recruit people who work hands-on in semiconductors as instructors. Also, the government is going to work with the chip industry to establish a semiconductor institution for students, job seekers and other workers in 2023 and train 3,600 people within five years. Last but not least, the government will bolster support for R&D in the next generation logic semiconductors. It aims to increase Korea's global market share in logic chips from the current 3 percent to 10 percent by 2030. It's also going to provide some 950 billion won or more than 700 million dollars for feasibility studies on power semiconductors and automotive chips. Another goal is for Korea to achieve a self-sufficiency rate in semiconductor parts of 50 percent by 2030 by expanding support for R&D. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Samsung Electronics is poised to expand its manufacturing presence in the U.S. state of Texas over the next two decades by building 11 new chip plants. Now, according to documents filed with Texas authorities, the South Korean tech giant has applied for tax cuts on a $167.6 billion investment plan for nine new plants in Taylor and a $24.5 billion for two new facilities in Austin. Now, this is in addition to two factories already in Austin and one that's currently in operation in Taylor. Samsung reportedly plans to create 10,000 jobs with its latest undertaking. The foreign ministry will seek tangible diplomatic engagements aimed at promoting national and global interests in line with the UN administration's key policy direction. Our Kim Dami explains. President Yoon suk has once again placed emphasis on the importance of economic diplomacy, pledging to do all he can to help South Korea's economy. Further, such comments came on Thursday after South Korea's foreign minister briefed President Yoon on the ministry's policy agenda. President Yoon said economic diplomacy is what's most important. He said he will visit anywhere if it helps our economy. He then called for active diplomacy that leads to global solidarity and cooperation, as well as a diplomacy with the U.S., China and Japan based on a strong, hard Washington alliance. Winning the city of Busan the right to host the 2030 World Expo topped the president's order to the top diplomat. The president also made sure to touch on China's backlash against South Korea's participation in reorganizing the global supply chain. Park said he also ordered active diplomacy so that China does not misunderstand, making sure that there is explanation in advance and misunderstandings it can be sorted out. Park added that as far as participation in the IPAF and possibly in FAF4, another U.S.-led chip alliance that would involve Japan and Taiwan is not to ostracize a certain country but to maximize a national interest. There will also be a, quote, bold plan to stop North Korea from showing off its military capabilities. We will lay out the roadmap for the North's denuclearization and for the normalization and fundamental development of inter-Korean relations. 
During Thursday's briefing, Yoon further expressed a strong will to soften bilateral ties with Japan so that the two countries can build trust that is mutually beneficial. Kim Dami, Arirang News. And speaking about the neighboring country, the foreign ministry here has taken issue with Japan's latest claims over South Korea's Tokto Island. The claim itself was included in an annual defense white paper on Friday, marking the 18th consecutive year that Tokyo has done so. Now, Seoul's foreign ministry in response released a statement demanding a retraction of the claim, which it added hurts diplomatic and bilateral ties. The ministry also summoned a senior diplomat from the Japanese embassy, Makoto Hayashi, to reiterate the need for Japan to retract its false claims. On the local political front, ruling and opposition lawmakers have agreed on the running of parliamentary affairs over the next two years. Of the 18 standing committees, the ruling People Power Party will take seven leadership positions, while the opposition Democratic Party will take 11, proportionate to the number of seats each party holds. Committees led by the PPP will include the Judiciary Committee with legislative rights to review and approve bills, as well as the committee in charge of the presidential office. The DP will lead the Budget Committee, among others. Now, meanwhile, the two most contentious committees responsible for broadcasting and police force will be shared with both parties taking turns to lead for one year each. The PPP will take charge of the Public Security Committee, while the DP will head the Media Committee first. The Culture Ministry is seeking a facelift for Chongwa Day to change it into a cultural centerpiece. Now, plans to this end were shared by the minister himself during his report at the top office. Our Kim Bo has details. South Korea's new cultural landmark. That's the vision for the former presidential office, the Blue House or Chongwa Day. On Thursday, Culture Minister Park Bo Gyun reported to President Yoon Seo Gyal on the five major goals ministry has in mind. They include turning the Blue House into a living, breathing cultural hub. People think of Chongwa Day as just a landscape, somewhere static. In the next stage, Chongwa Day should be given to the people as a place that's alive. This is the first time that the government has unveiled detailed plans for this historical place since it was opened to the public in May. Making use of the hundreds of artworks, memorabilia of former presidents, the 50,000 trees, as well as the cultural assets in the compound, the facility will become an art museum and cultural complex. The indoor area of the main office building and the official residence will be used as an exhibition venues, like France's Versailles Palace. Young Bingguan, where large-scale meetings and official events for state guests were held, will be filled with well-known contemporary and modern artwork, such as the Igonhi collection. Other main goals have also been revealed. There will be financial support for K-Content to nurture 10,000 industry professionals over the next three years, a fund of 30 million U.S. dollars to create more K-dramas for online streaming services, and a $3.6 billion investment to create a global content company like Disney. The ministry will also support the pure art sector, often the sources of K-culture, guarantee fair access for people with disabilities, and develop regional culture centers for balanced development. Through this financial support, South Korea aims to further establish itself as a self-power giant. Kim bo Arirang News. And that ends part one of the Daily Report. In part two, we touch upon a Korean drama that's gaining quite a bit of attention here and elsewhere. Stay with us. Extraordinary climate crisis and pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. Of its North Korea policy is Protesters gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters?
So good right now. Maybe I had a drink or two, but this somehow feels like it's forever. All my friends are here having fun and feeling good right now. Maybe this is forever. All my friends are here having fun and feeling good right now. Welcome back. A new Korean drama has been topping Netflix's most watched weekly global chart this month. Extraordinary Attorney Woo is a drama about a young female autistic lawyer and her daily experiences both professionally and personally. Now, For more on this drama's popularity, I have film critic Jason Bef Bechavez here in the studio. Jason, it's a pleasure. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I also have JC John Sese Kuneta, a blogger and a fan of Korean K dramas, that is, in the Philippines, live on the line. JC, it's good to have you with us. Yes, thank you for having me. Right, JC, let's start here in the studio then. Could we start with a few words about the success factors, so to speak, behind this new K drama? Yeah, it's generating a lot of attention here in Korea. Um, it, it's also. Uh, performing extremely well on Netflix, it's topping their non-English uh, charts and uh, it's another success story. It seems one after the other, of course, we have uh, Squid Game and before that we have Parasites and uh, uh, they also had All of Us Are Dead, the zombie series as well that came a, a little bit later. And now we have this, uh, this new K-drama, uh, Extraordinary uh, Attorney uh, You, and it, it, it's really good. I mean, it's a, it's a very engaging uh, series uh, about a lawyer who suffers from autism. Um, and I think it's shedding light on, on the difficulties uh, faced, uh, facing those who suffer from autism, but it's also a, a series in which uh, the leading uh, character has agency. You know, she's able to make her own decisions, uh, and I think that's crucially important. I think it's behind, and also behind uh, the success of the series for sure, both locally and internationally. Right. JC, your review of Extraordinary Attorney Wu has been making a bit of local headlines here in the country. Now, for the sake of our viewers who have not read your review, could you give us a brief rundown of your remarks with regard to this Korean drama series? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, when I first heard my reviews were translated into Korean, I was surprised. So I only wanted to react on how this show portrayed autism as well as to help explain the different attributes Jung Wu has shown. So, for example, uh, when she was a little kid, she swayed from left to right. So it is one way of steaming, and there are different ways and reasons why uh, autistic steam. So it, the, the, these are the uh, things that I gave feedback on, hoping to at least help other people appreciate the show, the character, and to know more about autism. And I am glad that uh, people are accepting the reviews and giving uh, positive feedback.
Right, JC, I understand extraordinary attorney who has a personal appeal for you. Do you care to elaborate? Uh, yes, uh, the show is very close to me because it is an advocacy about autistic persons and it shows the challenges autistic people face on a daily basis. So this show exposes the discrimination, the prejudice, and the stigma surrounding autism and all the disabilities and disorders for that matter. So it also demonstrates how to interact with an autistic person. Like, for example, how to tell an autistic about boundaries. So in one episode, Jun Ho told Yungwo that they can talk about her favorite subject only when they are eating lunch. So it may be rude for non-autistics, but for autistics, boundaries are important and is understood. Of course, not two autistics are the same. It is a three-dimensional spectrum after all. So, and this is what I like with the show. While they are trying to tell a story, there are strong messages in every aspect of it. Right, they are indeed, of course, raising awareness about autism. Jason, Extraordinary Otenewu is really not the only Korean uh, screen production to deal with disabilities. Could you tell us a bit more about some of the other productions that we have? Yeah, of course. Uh, there's a number of series. There's The Good Doctor, of course. Uh, my uh, kind of specialty is Korean films. Uh, and whilst there have not been uh, loads of films dealing with uh, mental health difficulties, there have been uh, a few notable uh, features, as Yi Chang-dong's Oasis, of course, released in 2002, sorry, in Seol gyeong -gu, a character who has mental health problems, and he, his character uh, forms a relationship with uh, a young woman played by uh, Moon so suffering from cerebral palsy. And the film is, is very damning in, in the way uh, it sees society and how and how those around these individuals who are suffering from mental health problems and how they're being rejected, essentially, and isolated uh, from society. And then you also have the Bong Joon-ho films, and uh, he loves these characters. Uh, one of the first suspects in Memories of Murder uh, suffers from learning disabilities. You've got the Song Gang-ho character in The Host. And then, of course, the Won Bin character in Mother as well, who, suffer, who also suffers from learning disabilities. And I think they, they, they are characters that he's attracted to. Um, I want to see more of these films, more of these series, because I think it's important that we learn uh, more about the difficulties that they face in society, uh, but also it's important to give these characters agency. It's important that they're able to make their own decisions, um, and we're seeing that with Our Blues. Um, uh, one of the characters in, in that series suffers from Down syndrome, uh, and the actress herself suffers from Down syndrome, and I think that's an incredible uh, developments and I think that's something that should be encouraged and I hope we see more of that in the future. Right and keeping that in mind uh, JC what are your thoughts what more that is can you tell us about the portrayal of autism spectrum disorder in this particular drama that would be extraordinary attorney Ooh. Yes I am I am happy and satisfied about uh, the portrayal of the autism spectrum disorder in this drama they showed more of the different uh, autistic attributes not commonly seen in other shows, at least for those regions I am familiar with. And a good example is when Jung Wo explained how, uh, uh, how looking straight into other people's eyes is the most difficult thing for autistics. So this was portrayed in a non-stereotypical way. So another uh, good example is in episode three, when Jung Wo was the attorney for an autistic client who was uh, wrongfully accused in relation to the death of his brother, uh, they, uh, they showed clearly, they portrayed how autism spectrum is a very wide uh, spectrum, where, uh, wherein uh, we may meet different people with autism, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will be, uh, other autistics are the same as the other, as the other autistic that we've met. So uh, another thing that I really like is when uh, they showed the parents of, the, of her client, the, of her uh, autistic client. So the parents were jealous of her when they saw how she is uh, high functioning while their son is low functioning. So this was a good portrayal because they captured and brought to screen what 
uh, parents actually feel. Right, I would have to agree right there, actually. Uh, Jason, you talked about needing to have further exposure of such disabilities on the screens. And having said that, what are some issues that we need to keep in mind while we try to include these aspects of society into productions? Well, the first thing I'd say is that um, we need diversity in Korean cinema. Korean cinema is is booming right now and that is a fantastic thing and uh, we've seen so many series and films uh, do uh, extraordinarily well uh, but I think th I think the industry needs to reflect the diversity that we're seeing in Korea uh, and that's uh, that's culture diversity but it's also um, uh, having characters uh, that are suffering from physical and mental disabilities and ensuring that the, we have actors that perhaps you know that are that are suffering themselves playing these 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 roles as in uh, Isle Blues which I think is a good example of course it's an industry and we have celebrities you need to have you know these high profile actors in the shows to attract attention uh, but I think it's also important that we we have uh, have this reflected in the cast and, uh, as well. Um, and yeah, giving the characters agency, I think that's really important. And so they're not too condescending, um, finding that balance between having uh, a strong social critique, uh, but also making them entertaining um, and not exploitative. Right, which really is a daunting task. It is a daunting task, it's challenging. Right. right. We now take a moment to speak with an actual attorney about the broader legal elements within the Korean drama extraordinary attorney Wu. I have David Park, an attorney at Yun and Yang, on the line. David, thank you for making the time to join us live. Hi there, thank you for having me. Right, so David, as an attorney yeah. yourself, what are your thoughts with regard to this particular drama? Well, yeah, I just started actually watching the drama, but um, I'm actually really impressed and um, I'd really like to commend, you know, the producers and, um, you know, everyone involved about, you know, how thoroughly and accurately, like, um, the drama has been um, actually made. And, you know, and I think, you know, the... You know the great thing about this drama is like the you know authenticism and how it really depicts uh you know reality in the courtroom and in the legal environment so you know i think it's really great and also the fact that it really puts a spotlight and brings attention to um autism which is not a topic or issue that has been um you know i guess um you know, well addressed in other Korean medias or dramas. Right. David, what can you yeah. tell us actually about the real life presence of perhaps autistic lawyers here in South Korea and over in the US for the sake of comparison? Well, just to be totally truthful, I'm not sure about anyone in Korea uh, who's practicing that actually has um, the condition, but you know, I'm well aware overseas, especially in the U.S., there are, uh, you know, quite quite a few, actually, quite, you know, quite a few um, practicing lawyers who have, um, you know, ASD autism and who have done really well. So um, I guess that, I guess, you know, going back to, you know, what I said, this really brings the spotlight in Korea, how, you know, um, Korea as a country and a society treats, um, people with, you know, autism or other similar conditions. And I think it's really great that this drama has brought this issue to the forefront right. of um, society. Yeah, and other and legal circles, yeah. David, some say the legal setting of the drama itself, including the interior of the law firm there, is quite similar to that in real life. What do you say to that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I've talked with my colleagues in the legal, and, you know, legal circles in general and bloggers have, you know, really said that um, it's, you know, it's surprisingly, surprisingly, the drama is really realistic in terms of the courtroom setting and, you know, the terminology that's used and the interactions in the courtroom between the judges and the lawyers. So in that aspect, it's, um, you know, you could say generally it's been, you know, it's an accurate depiction of really what goes on in the legal environment. But I do beg to differ about, um, the interior of the law firm. So I think that's the only <laughs> inaccuracy. This is just my personal opinion, but um, of how, you know, the, you know, the law firm partners room, you know, offices are so, you know, spacious and flashy. 
Um, right, they're really posh in yeah. the drama. Yeah, you're very posh. And so I, I, I yeah, so I, I, I never, in my, you know, personally, in my, in my personal experience, I've never seen, um, you know, any <laughs> attorney or lawyer's um, office, which is that flashy and um, spacious. So right. I think Unfortunately. You know, in that point, it's a bit inaccurate. I <laughs> yeah. see. And yeah. very briefly yeah. speaking, David, do you suppose this particular K-drama has raised awareness about the need to better address discrimination against the disabled in society? Very briefly. Yeah. Yes, so um, it's brought about discussion. So some some circles um, have you know criticised um, you know the, its inaccuracy. Some say it's very accurate. So I think you know and you know just to address your question, the fact that it's brought about and created all these discussions um, and sort of arguments is is actually I think a very you know a good point, and it's also. Um, has brought to the forefront and to the spotlight about anti-discrimination in Korea. So, I, you know, in that from that perspective, I think the drama has really done its job on creating awareness, which is the beginning of it, of change. Right. I would have to agree with you right there. All right, David. Thank yeah. you so much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you for having me. Right then, back here in the studio, Jason, you spoke about Our Blues, the recent television series, and the cast there, like you mentioned, included a, uh, a member, an actress, with a real-life Down syndrome, of course. What did you think about the acting skills of this uh, actress? Her name's Chong Eun here, by the way. Yeah, Johnny, she's terrific. Um, she had no acting experience uh, beforehand, or so I read. Um, the director uh, uh, met quite a few uh, people suffering from Down syndrome and uh, uh, yeah, the director met uh, th this particular actress and was really uh, attracted to her in, in terms of the way she was able to uh, capture this particular character and by all accounts she's incredibly popular on set uh, and that's so uh, endearing I and uh, I think that really added to the, the kind of the genuine uh, nature of the of the series in trying to uh, have a character who is suffering from Down syndrome uh, and addressing some of the issues uh, and yet also trying to make it as affectionate as possible uh, and also genuine and sincere and that's not easy to do um, and you know we all know that Korean dramas uh, can be quite melodramatic and sentimental uh, but also at the same time um, they do try to tackle these issues and I think that Our Blues does that very well and I'm very happy for her uh, and I hope she I and mean, I gather she has quite a fan base now and I look forward to seeing what she's up to next and I want to see her in some Korean films as well and uh, yeah uh, right it's, me it's too it's inspiring let's be it honest it really is actually it really is JC I'm aware that you've watched quite a number of Korean productions <laughs> both for the big screen and the small screen that being said with regard to Korean dramas that deal with disabilities JC is there a case style perhaps of reaching out to audiences uh, I can think of three things so number one the careful approach on how to portray a character with a disability or disorder so instead of creating a character with a particular at attributes needed for the story, so they focus on the character and uh, they built up the character in a way that it appeals to a lot of audiences. Then number two, they focus on the person's abilities instead of their disability. So as was shown in Extraordinary Attorney Wu and in Our Blues, so those are those two are very good examples on how how uh, K dramas uh, create JC, these I, characters. I love the idea of yeah. showing their abilities instead of their disabilities. I love that line. And that being said, Jason, let's end with a few words of advice from you for the Korean content industry with amid the growing global interest in Korean productions. Yeah, very interesting point right now. Um, I think we're in a phase of transition. What's going to happen over the next two or three years will ultimately determine what happens over the next decade. So we've got uh, we've got local streamers kind of coming together to try and compete against Netflix. We uh, recently learned of the the merger between uh, TVing or the, C the company run by CJ uh, and also the the KT streaming platform, uh, one of Korea's top mobile phone network providers. Um, and 
And uh, yeah, I mean, Netflix are clearly leading the way. And then also we have uh, cinemas coming back to life. Uh, Che Dong Hun's new film Alienoid was released a couple of days ago. We've got a number of films released over the summer. We had the Roundup star Madong Suk do extremely well, selling over 12 million tickets. We've got what 100 Korean films waiting release. And Korean, cult, uh, Korean content right now is immensely popular. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's immense interest uh, from investors, from the public. Um, and I think there's going to, it's going to be quite um, intense what happens over the next few months and few years. But it will calm down. And when it does calm down, I think we're going to see uh, the, the industry kind of, um, uh, in terms of the developments, I think uh, we're, it will stabilize and, we'll, and that will ultimately determine, like I say, what happens over the next decade. Right, I see. All right, Jason, as always, thank you very much for your time no and your problem. thoughts. And JC over in the Philippines, thank you very much for your insight today. Thank you too. In Europe, the central bank there has surprised markets with a higher-than-expected interest rate hike, which is also the first hike in more than a decade. Our Kim Hyo-san has mourned this latest effort to rein in global inflation. The European Central Bank decided Thursday to raise its interest rates by a larger-than-expected half percentage point. The bank's first rate hike in 11 years, which now takes its key interest rate to 0%. I think, you know, it's the first time in over a decade that we raise interest rates. And uh, moving out of negative interest rates, by all accounts, certainly to me, uh, is going to facilitate a number of things that we can explain to European citizens uh, in order to help them understand what we are trying to do in order to reduce inflation and in order to procure price stability. The bold move comes as continuing inflation, which hit a record 8.6% in June, adds to concerns about growth, while the Eurozone is still suffering from the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Amid a continued increase in consumer prices, the ECB had previously signaled it would be increasing rates in July and September. But it was unclear whether it would go as far as rising rates to zero. The bank's deposit rate is now 0 percent, the main refinancing operations rate is 0.5 percent, and the marginal lending facility is at 0.75 percent. The ECB also announced that it would provide extra help for the 19-country currency blocks more indebted countries like Italy through a new bond purchase scheme. This, it says, is aimed at capping the rise in their borrowing costs and limiting financial fragmentation. Following the announcement, the euro rose to a session high on Thursday to trade at a dollar and two cents. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. And there has been a dramatic development amid Russia's ongoing assault against Ukraine. The two countries are poised to seal a deal to ensure the exports of real, r Ukrainian grain, that is, to help address the global shortage. Our Isang has more on that deal. Turkey was able to succeed where others have failed over the past five months by brokering an agreement between Russia and Ukraine. While the agreement won't halt Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine, it will relieve a global food crisis caused by blocked Black Sea grain exports as a result of the war. The agreement, which was said to be signed formally on Friday, comes amid soaring global food prices and the threat of starvation for people in some of the world's poorest countries. The agreement was made possible thanks to talks being held by officials of the two countries in Istanbul last week, with Turkish and UN officials in attendance. Despite previous denials from the Kremlin, Russia has been preventing Ukrainian ports from exporting grain, causing a massive food supply shortage, as Ukraine is one of the world's biggest grains exporters. Under the terms of the deal, shipments could resume from three ports under full Ukrainian control before possibly being expanded further. In response, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price welcomed the news, but insisted it was a problem caused by Moscow in the first place. The fact is that, to date, Russia has weaponized uh, food 
during this conflict. Uh, they have destroyed agricultural facilities. They prevented uh, millions of tons of Ukrainian grain from getting to, to those who need it. Uh, as I said, we welcome the announcement of this agreement in principle, but what we're focusing on now uh, is holding Russia accountable for implementing uh, this agreement and for enabling uh, Ukrainian grain to get to world markets. Under the agreement, the safety of the shipments would be overseen by a UN monitoring group based in Istanbul. However, Ukraine remains skeptical, saying that Russian ships should not be allowed into Ukrainian waters as part of the anticipated agreement. Lee seung Arirang News. On a light note now, for those of you here in Seoul, a trip to Chungnogu district downtown may be worth your while this weekend. More specifically, there has been a historical facelift between Changgyeonggung Palace and Chungmyo Shrine. Our Song Yujin has a preview. The Chungnogu district, located in downtown Seoul, has been the heart of culture in the city for the last 600 years, following the establishment of the Joseon dynasty. It's the home to a plethora of cultural heritage locations. One of them is South Korea's first UNESCO World Heritage Site, Chongmyo Shrine, that honors kings, queens, and long-deceased royal ancestors. Another is Changgyeonggung Palace, which, in its day, often served as the residence for queens and concubines. Until the early 20th century, the two sites were connected by a forest. But that all changed under Japanese colonization. Most people in Joseon during the early 1900s walked around or rode carriages. However, the Japanese wanted a road system centered around cars. So they decided to create new straight roads that were fit for driving. That's why this road, which is now called Yulgongno, was opened in April of 1932. Before, Changgyeonggung Palace and Jongmyo Shrine were divided by a road and a pedestrian overpass. But now, for the first time in 90 years, they're connected once again after more than 10 years of work. The city has now replaced the road with an underpass, creating an 8,000-square-meter unbroken green area linking the two sites. The area also features a restored 503-meter-long wall that had been destroyed by Japan during the colonial period, with about 20 percent of the material used in its construction coming from the original. The Pukshimun entrance that kings once used to unofficially visit Chongmyo Shrine from Changgyeonggung Palace has also been reconstructed. Another new addition is the 340-meter-long walkway where visitors can take a look at the palace and shrine closely. Both the general public and the city government are excited about the project. I decided to visit here during my stay in Seoul because it's historically meaningful that an area that was ruined under Japanese occupation has reopened. This project helped us restore a part of our history which was disconnected by Japanese colonization. Also in the past, palaces and shrines were only accessible to the royal family. By opening this area to the public, we hope more people can better understand the history revolving around these heritage sites. The area will be fully open to the public from Friday. Song Yujin, Arirang News. And it's that time of the year again when adults and children alike are welcome to roll in the mud over in Poryong. My colleague Kim Yun-sung was there to indulge in the pleasure of getting muddy. Mud doubles the fun. Poryong Mud Festival is back on. For the past 25 years, this annual summer mud fest has been one of the most looked forward to and biggest events of the year in South Korea. Here at the festival at Daejeon Beach in Chungcheongnam-do province, it's all about getting dirty in the mud. And the best part is, anyone can join in the fun. Language or age doesn't matter. Families, friends and children have come all across the country and from all across the world to right here in Poryong to get a feel for this muddy fun. We thought it was really a good idea and it's fun, so I heard it's good for the skin too, so... We, yeah, we, we enjoy it. Too. We don't mind getting dirty. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was like the perfect event for us. It's so much fun. I love the mud. <laughs> this is so much fun and there are so many things to do. I want to go to the K-pop concert afterwards. 
Uh, there are a bunch of games in the, this one mud pit. Um, I learned a lot of new games, uh, meet a lot of new people, so it's pretty cool. I came with my brothers and my mom. The slides were exciting and slippery. This year, the event runs from July 16th to August 15th. Podium City officials are expecting somewhere close to 1.2 million visitors. To prepare, they've brought in 600 tons of mud from nearby beaches. For the past two years, Podium Mud Festival has been held online due to the pandemic. But now it is back in full. But once again, COVID cases are on the rise. Right now, everybody has to wear a mask when they come in, and during the evenings, we sanitize the whole place. That's how we're preparing right now, and we are a bit nervous because numbers are rising. Poryong is famous for its tidal mudflats. But because sandy beaches are usually more popular, Poryong city officials had to get creative to attract visitors by promoting the benefits of mud. Mud is excellent at removing toxins from the skin and carbon from the air. It also keeps important sea life alive. To teach visitors about mud, an exposition runs alongside the festival. The expo also sells mud skincare products with other regional goodies offered by some 80 companies taking part in the expo. This month-long festival is also packed with K-pop concerts by the beach, fireworks and competitions. So to get that special experience of watching a K-pop concert while your toes are dipped in the waves and have your clothes dripping in mud, there's only one place to go, and that's here at Poryong. Kim Hyun-sun, Arirang News, Poryong. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Europe is seeing a resumption of gas supplies from Russia. After being shut down for 10 days since July 11th for supposed repairs, partial gas flows resumed on Thursday through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. But Russia's largest pipeline running under the Baltic Sea into Germany is only operating at 40% levels, and its resumption comes a day after Russian President Vladimir Putin warned that supplies could be reduced or even stopped. Before the temporary halt, the pipeline was only at 40% capacity due to Europe's opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Despite the resumption, German officials are wary of potential future interruptions amid growing concerns about energy supplies this winter. They have accused Russia of weaponizing energy exports to, quote, blackmail Europe. Italy is looking at an early election following the resignation of the country's prime minister, Mario Draghi. He will stay on as caretaker leader until early elections are held on September 25th. Draghi's second resignation request in a week was accepted on Thursday by President Sergio Mattarella. This comes after three parties in Draghi's fractured coalition government refused to back him in a confidence vote on Wednesday. Italy's parliament has now been dissolved ahead of the elections. India has selected a tribal leader as its president for the first time. Lawmakers voting for India's president on Thursday backed Tropaudi Murmu, a former teacher and member of the Santal community, one of India's largest tribal groups. The 64-year-old will now become the second woman to hold the largely ceremonial presidential seat. She is set to start her five-year term from July 25th. The move is seen as an attempt by India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party to build support among India's 100 million tribal people. In our final story, the world's oldest male giant panda under human care has died at the age of 35 in a Hong Kong zoo. According to Ocean Park on Thursday, An An was euthanized due to declining health. An An had been living at the facility since 1999 alongside Jia Jia, the world's oldest female giant panda, who died aged 38 in 2016. Both pandas were gifts to the park by the Chinese government 23 years ago. Two pandas remain at the facility, Ying Ying and Le Le, also gifts from China in 2007. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News.
Good Friday afternoon. Conditions in Seoul are quite muggy and hot as we are having some downpours with temperatures reaching 30 degrees and that is 5 degrees higher than yesterday. So your body won't cool down effectively when it's humid because there's nowhere for the sweat to go. So it makes you feel even much hotter. And yes, you do need an umbrella today. Summer showers are making an appearance across the country. Expected precipitation will vary from 5 to 40 millimeters, followed by blustery conditions. While checking today's high temperatures, the mercury is set to pass 30 degrees in most regions. And there's a heat advisory newly issued in parts of Gyeongsangdo province. So if you have to be outside today, dress in loose, light-colored clothes and wear a broad-brimmed hat and sunglasses. And we're about to wrap up the week with monsoon rain, so things will feel a bit cooler. But scorching heat will set in again from next week. So make sure you stay weather aware this weekend if you're planning to be outdoors. Have a great weekend, and now let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. Right, and that ends this edition of The Daily Report. Thank you for watching.